Good evening. Oh, are we on? Yeah, good. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to Shakespeare and Company. Um, according to David King, one of the protagonists of Joshua Cohen's new novel, 2008 was the worst year not to own your whole home in America, the best year to own an American moving business. Now it's seven years later, 2015, and David, newly divorced and plump on the proceeds of exploiting this particular loophole of the American dream, is preparing an apartment and a job for his distant cousin, Yoav, 21 years old and fresh out of military service in the Israeli Defence Force. It's supposed to be a chance for Yoav to see the world and put army life behind him. But soon after his arrival, followed quickly by his former squad mate and close friend Uri, it becomes clear Yoav's assumption that by changing the walls around him, he'd be changed within, was somewhat wide of the mark. Moving Kings is a story about identity, about economics, about race and about class. But perhaps above all, it's a story about homes, how they're built, how they're lost and how for some they can forever prove elusive. Already known as a master wordsmith, in Moving Kings, Joshua Cohen bends language so that it's in perfect alignment with the task at hand, the skewed psyches of his characters, the fractured flow of events, producing a reading experience that is as, as intoxicating as it is impressive. In addition to Moving Kings, Joshua Cohen is the author of four other novels, including Book of Numbers and Vits, several collections of short fiction, most recently Four New Messages, and has contributed non-fiction to the New York Times, Harper's Magazine, London Review of Books, N Plus One, among many others. Rachel Kushner called Moving Kings a dazzling and poignant book. The New York Times described Joshua Cohen as a major American writer, and earlier this year, Granter magazine included him on their decennial list of the best of young American novelists. Please join me in welcoming him to Shakespeare and Company. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. And I think we're going to kick off right away with a, a reading from near the beginning of Moving Kings. A little David King, yeah. Actually, just before we do, just concerning yeah. the title... Yeah. Um, and I, it, it's weird, I wouldn't necessarily ask any, many other writers this, but I was wondering about the specific emphasis on moving kings. Is it moving kings? Is it moving kings? Or I is don't this, know. Okay. Or could it be both? Yeah, I mean, you know, part of being published by Random House is that you can control every word that's in the book, but you can't control the title. Uh -huh. <laughs> and and uh, I wanted to call it In Occupation, mm -hmm. right? With with all of its polysemy, all of its sure. kind of levels of meaning. Uh, they didn't like that. We were sitting in a, uh, uh, a marketing meeting that I showed up at drunk, and uh, they polled everyone and they said, what do you think of In Occupation as a title? And most of the marketing department said it sounds just like a book called A Job. Mm -hmm. so, uh, so Moving Kings kind of came, came later. I mean, I think, you know, there was a, a, a line that I, I liked, which was, um, you know, to be a moving king is to be a dead king. Mm -hmm. You know, a king doesn't really move anywhere or or that quickly, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, and so it it's 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 it came from it came from that. Also, you know that that whole tradition of of um, it was I think it's an American tradition. It's, it seems like tied to radio advertisements of like the of of the twenties, where it's sort of like you know you're the mattress king, mm -hmm. you're the moving king. You know, it's like this is the business that you've cornered. And so, yeah, it mm -hmm. had some resonance there. Just in that explanation there, you gave it both emphases, actually. The, the emphases on moving mm -hmm. and the emphases on kings. So. Yeah, yeah. So let's take it. It could be one way or the other. It could be one way or the other. Okay. Let's do it. On which note? Over to you for okay. a read. All right. Um, well, thank you for, for, for doing this, and thank you for coming, and thank you to Shakespeare for having me, and uh, we'll see how this goes. Um, yeah, this is... I mean, we can talk, we're going to talk about the book a little bit, you know, later on, kind of where it goes. But this is uh, sort of the opening of the book, or toward the opening. It's David King, who runs a moving and storage company in, uh, in northern New Jersey, sort of services the um, greater New York area. And this is before his cousin, Yoav, comes over uh, from his compulsory service in the IDF to sort of work as a mover. And this is kind of the opening where he's at a, um, a Republican uh, a fundraiser in the Hamptons on the 4th of July on American Independence Day. You know, where I spend my time. <laughs> it was summer, toward the weekend of a holiday week. Moving day, last day of the month, first day of the month, followed by Independence Day. And David King was out in the Hamptons at a birthday party for America to which he'd been invited as a member of the Empire Club, 
which had required attendees to donate upwards of $4,000 for the privilege of drinking diluted booze and eating oversauced barbecue under the auspices of the New York State Republican Committee. Inviting him to a party and then making him pay, that was class. That was how billionaires stayed billionaires. And David, who'd resented even the toll to the Long Island Expressway, couldn't help but wonder whether he'd met $4,000 worth of people yet. He couldn't help valuating everything, the people, the property, the Victorianized manse shadowing the pool. His phone was vibrating again in his pocket. He canceled the call. He was working. He was working by attending a party at which he didn't know anyone or knew only that he recognized names, faces, profiles. It was work, having to restrain himself from mentioning mergers he'd only read about, acquisitions that weren't his, a celebrity stranger's divorce custody negotiations still ongoing, having to endure discussions of clean ocean and beach replenishment initiatives when all he wanted to know was, daughter or wife? When all he wanted to know was, does anyone know where our host is? It was work, pretending he blended, he mixed, pretending he wasn't sweating and had a second residence of his own and was a Hamptons veteran and agreeing, yes, yes, hadn't the Meadow Lane heliport gotten so crowded lately? And yes, yes, isn't Ray from Elite Landscapers just the best? Because the fact remained that David had never been this far out on Long Island before. And not only couldn't he tell you which of the Hamptons he was in, he couldn't even tell you the number of Hamptons, or the differences between the Hamptons, or what made a Hampton a Hampton singular to begin with. Hope we're not keeping you, a lady said. David said, come again? You keep checking your phone. I've got far in business, he says. Never stops. It's already July 5th somewhere. And he excused himself from that besant of lawn, and its assembly of skinny flagpole women flying dresses in red, white, and blue. Ruth, his office manager, had been calling without leaving messages. Now she was texting, sorry, sorry, Bill is sick. Have take Bill Jr. b-ball practice. And then texting, anyway, not finding my pass card. David made his way among tents. Buffet tables of chafing and carving and bars. The trick was to keep on the move. Kids. Put David around kids, and he'd fantasize about having them. And only then would he recall that he had a daughter who was an adult now. The kids were having their faces smeared native with war paint. They bounced around on a giant inflatable galleon, parried and thrust with balloon swords. A breeze blew in with the dung of elephant rides. He moved among servers who made $8.75 an hour, and so who made about 14 cents, 14.5833 cents, he did the figures in his head, for each minute it took them to carve him prime rib, or fix him a scotch, or direct him and his menthols to a smoking area. Conversations collected as they were conducted in circles about stocks, about real estate, stocks, about renovations and how draining it was to open a house for the season. Apparently, to have two houses meant always neglecting one of them, at least. About alarm systems, sprinkler systems, sump pumps, white versus black mold. About politics. David's politics were aspirational, inferior. He was in favor of contacts, contracts, the right to not diet, and the right to jump lines at dessert stations. This is a long sentence here, so you'll bear with me. David King was a man who, if a longtime employee flaked on a commitment on short notice because her ex-husband was too ill to take their son to a baseball practice that wasn't even hardball but actually softball, or if his prime rib came closer to medium than to the already spineless concession that was medium rare, or if his Doers 18 turned out to be Doers 15 or 12, or God forbid, came with an ice cube or even just an extra splash of water. 
Or if the line for the dessert station was moving so indecisively slowly that his ice cream would melt before he got to the toppings he liked. It wasn't his fault that he was so decisive about his toppings. He'd scream. He'd have a conniption. And yet once he'd fudged his sundae with a cherry atop, he had all the attention, all the guilty, sated, childlike attention for being lectured by an Ivy League B student on the new model Gulf Streams, though David didn't have his own plane. The best sailing routes, though David didn't have his own boat. The best steeplechase courses, David didn't even have a pony. How New York State was the most regulated state in the Union. The state with the highest taxes, the state with the highest energy costs, the highest fuel costs, the highest insurance premiums, and a convoluted body of tort law that made even the Nazi justice system seem unbiased and lenient. And how so-and-so was really the only candidate to bet on, so-and-so the only candidate who had real plans, both for the Middle East and for mid-sized American businesses, the only candidate who was legitimately pro-growth. And that was the line, or the jargon, that struck him and brought to mind the image of a small, modest, neat building like some four-floor pre-war walk-up in the village, which, with every vote for a Republican, grew taller by the floor until it became this big, shiny tower that clock-handed all of Manhattan. And then, by association, pro-growth, his mind flashed below his belt, which was on its last notch, and below his gut, which hung like a panting tongue over it, to his bloodless dick, which as if his heart had betrayed the party platform, pro-growth, dangled, limp, and useless. Thank you so much. Thank you. I think that's a, obviously a great introduction to the, um, the, the character of David. Um, I'd like to talk a little bit about the, his occupation, the industry he works in. It seems to me in a way that in... At certain times, there are certain jobs which seem sort of archetypal of the epoch. You know, that might be the, you know, that might be the the cowboy, that might be the suburban worker, that might be the, you know, the Wall Street banker in the 80s. Mm -hmm. And at this particular time, after the financial crisis of 2008 and what we've seen since, the first thing I thought when reading a book about a, a, a moving company which sort of adapted its um, its activity to, to profit from this, mm -hmm. it seemed in a way that that, was in some way perhaps the archetypal industry of our times. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, f for me it was actually not even the moving, but the storage aspect. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, I, I, you know, in thinking about this book and talking to a number of people and, and doing, you know, I mean, research is such a big word, mm -hmm. more just drinking with people and seeing where things go. You know, it's really, you know, storage was something businesses used to do. Mm -hmm. You know, you have records, you know, especially before computers, you have records on paper, you need to keep them somewhere you would have a storage facility that would keep them. And really, storage became an industry for private individuals, really, in the 80s in America. And the idea that, you know, you would earn money to buy shit that you couldn't fit in the place where you're living, so you rent a place to keep the shit that you don't deal with. And, and these things were in outer neighborhoods, which, with gentrification and with the growth of cities became neighborhoods that people lived in mm -hmm. and yet these neighborhoods were full of these sort of concrete pillbox wartime looking buildings this gray concrete you know monoliths that are full of just stuff mm -hmm. that people didn't want to see and um and so storage became kind of an archetypal business and moving and storage are very intertwined mm -hmm. you know especially when people are moving to a smaller place and need to, you know, downsize the corporate word, which has become in English like a, a, a regular word, and you need a place to put things. And, uh, and then certainly it became a, a, a rapacious and deeply immoral industry with the, the, the real spike in evictions, mm -hmm. where, um, you know, you would go in, and, and in, in New York City, I mean, every state has different laws about this, but in New York State, you know, the city marshals would go in uh, with a moving crew that was bonded to do that, so it had the insurance to do it, and they would go into someone's house who had defaulted on their mortgage, and they would give someone a choice. You know, it's like a, a curb or store, mm -hmm. meaning everything you own could go on the curb, and fuck it, it's up to you, you know, or store, 
which means it goes to the storage unit and they have 30 days, 60 days, 90 days, depending, to pay the money to redeem. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and of course, that very rarely happens. The money that you get is usually going to finding another place to have a roof over your head. So, um, so then that, after whatever period, 30 days, 60 days, 90 days, that would uh, revert to the storage company, to the moving and storage company, and they would auction it off. And they would they would profit off of off of your possessions, and so 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 that that nexus of moving and storage, and the way in which it so seamlessly converted other people's possessions um, into yet other people's possessions um, was fascinating to me, mm -hmm. and does seem in, in, in a way a, a representative or emblematic occupation for our time. Mm -hmm. There is a kind of a strange poignancy to it, I think. I mean, I've always felt kind of an unease at places like flea markets, where there's sort of objects that were once important to somebody, were once part of somebody's life, mm -hmm. which are then being sort of being traded on and sort of... Right. And, and I think there's a scene early on in, in Moving Kings where... Um, David is walking through the the depot, the warehouse, mm -hmm. um, and in order to, to furnish the, the flat for uh, for, for your yeah, when it comes, yeah. um, and and as I say, I found it quite sort of. Um, this is a moment where you said each unit had its drama. Each was an inventory of the of an absent person's life, all the stuff they hadn't been able to live with but weren't prepared to lose. Right, and there, there is something about that to sort of this the these objects which we which we acquire in order to define ourselves. And then when our image of ourselves changed because of our circumstances or because of yeah. um, whatever's happening, we kind of, we, we still want to hold on to them nonetheless. Yeah, I mean, in many ways, storage units can serve as, you know, it's the subconscious. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's the physicalized subconscious of a person. It's what they've decided that they can live without in their daily life, but they can't live without in terms of, you know, stripping their entire identity of mm -hmm. that, you know, of those objects. And yeah, and, and, and you know, so going through storage lockers is very much a, uh, uh, a you know, sort of a, a it's an interesting um, uh, archaeology, mm -hmm. you know, um, in, in a lot of ways, the, the, you know, I mean, I was just thinking about this today, because I'm, you know, I'm a stupid romantic who has, you know, very malformed ideas about everything. Mm -hmm. So, you know, y you have this, 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 this specter that is hung over um, a lot of philosophy and critical theory coming out of like Walter Benjamin, mm -hmm. Benjamin's thoughts about Paris, mm -hmm. and the idea of like the flaneur being this sort of you know collector of the detritus mm -hmm. of a culture, and being able within the you know to to sort of shine things up that are trash mm -hmm. and make them new and present a culture's trash to itself as a you know um, again as a emblematic or representative of the culture. The thing that you thought was disposable, in fact, you know, is 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 a a a, a sign mm -hmm. of the culture, and in a lot of ways, you know, storage is like uh, is a branch of philosophy, right? It it is it's a, it's it's this middle ground between we're not able to dispose of it, and yet we're not able to live with it, mm -hmm. and it's this limbo, and the businesses that exist in this limbo, I think, are um, for me are fascinating, mm -hmm. and uh, especially because. These things are um, uh, are typically done in the shadows. I mean, these are not businesses that are that are discussed. And in fact, you know, if if you have to point a finger and say, you know, this is who to blame, which is so difficult to do in 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 in, in capitalism. You know, are you going to blame the bank that that owns the note, or are you going to blame seven banks later that after six banks have collapsed has inherited the note on the house and takes the house? Are you going to blame the trader who decided to bundle certain mm -hmm. notes into other tranches of notes mm -hmm. that had then sold them as completely invisible tranches to yet fourth or fifth parties? You know, and uh, and part of David King's part of the thing that enables him to function mm -hmm. is to say, at least I live in the physical world. Mm -hmm. I do a job that most people don't want to do. I do a, a dangerous job, and um, but at least it knows it knows what it is mm -hmm. and uh and and it's that tension that that animates david king that that interested me and also i mean you mentioned uh, this sense of a limbo and mm -hmm. in a way when we meet david king at the beginning of the book that that <laughs> term could almost be applied to his life as well because we mm -hmm. meet him sort of post a relatively recent heart attack right. post a relatively recent divorce mm -hmm. um 
Um, and having fucked things up with his with his daughter horribly, mm-hmm. and having you know had a kind of failed affair. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, and, and in a way, his kind of investment in furnishing this flat for Yoav is sort of a a representation of something's going on, which is his sort of his turning towards Israel hmm? uh, as some kind of as perhaps providing some sort of uh, solace or some sort of meaning in or this stability yeah. in this new in this new sense. But that wasn't always the case because uh, earlier on, he um, there was this moment where he I think he'd visited Israel once hmm? in his life and sort of. Um, uh, you say that like his thoughts regarding Israel tended to be similar to his thoughts regarding crises among his vendors and suppliers. Right, mm. right. As long as they kind of kept it going, mm-hmm. he wasn't really worried. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, uh. <laughs> but now, post heart attack, you know, yeah. he's, he's he's thinking. You said throughout all this, what bolstered him was Israel. The idea of it, the abstraction. Yeah. To have family in the country was to have the country in the family. In yeah. the family, yeah, the whole entire country. Right. Um, and I just wanted to talk a little bit about that sort of experience of the sort of um, of someone in David King's position. So his, for his family history, sort of his his father, his family emigrated to to the United States just after the the second world war yeah i mean the family split you know Mm -hmm. some of the family went to palestine the other Mm -hmm. part of the family went to went to went to the states um look i mean you know there's there's a way in which i you know thought about that um particular relationship with israel in a in in an autobiographical context Mm -hmm. and in a family context you know having lived there and having a lot of family there but there's also a way in which i i thought about it in a in a in a much broader context, which I think is, 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 you know, possibly more, maybe more interesting when a lot of people are staring at me. Um, <laughs> and that is, you know, I mean, I, I didn't write a nonfiction book, you know, uh, thank God. And, uh, and I didn't necessarily have a, a particular thesis in mind, but I will say that a lot of the things animating this, um, you know, the ideas in the book were really about, um, questions of identity mm-hmm. which is uh you know identity is such a fraught word uh, uh even fraught is a fraught word these days <laughs> and uh uh you know people used to say freighted it's a freighted word um i the idea of where does one derive one's identity from which is a crisis that america is currently having and that has uh uh maybe america has introduced to the world mm-hmm. and and everyone should thank America for it. Um, and that really, you know, finds its origins in the breakdown of, you know, the the white ethnic mm-hmm. working class, which, you know, y- you can say to a degree of, 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 of accuracy is, the, the, you know, the exact electorate that brought Trump to power. Mm-hmm. And it's a question of, you know, where does one derive their identity from? And it's, it's tough, mm-hmm. right? Um, you know, America being a, a multi-ethnic and a multi-racial society with a, a horrible uh, uh, record of, of slavery and, and systemic oppression, there's this idea that one derives one's identity from a, from a very cold document, from a constitution, uh, from a set of words that make a sort of s- certain set of promises. And, you know, and of course, you know, if you make enough money and you send your kid to a college, the kid will come back and remind you that the Constitution was written by white male slave owners who are pr- attempting to protect themselves from a crazy British king. It might be true, right? <laughs> um, but, but where does one then derive it? And the answer um, has always been in, in communities and in, and, and in, and in immigration-based communities, at least in the, um, in the white aspect of America. Um, and, uh, you know, those are things as enjoyable as depicted in mafia movies and, uh, and you know, Irish cop movies and in, you know, and in, in, in bad Woody Allen comedies. <laughs> and um, it was the notion that your identity was um, provided by your, um, your immediate familial or neighborhood context. And when through assimilation, and through just the, the march of time, those ties weaken. Mm-hmm. You begin to see a crisis of authenticity. You begin to see a crisis of um, what actually gives me some rooting. Mm-hmm. What, what comprises my social fabric? What makes me feel um, of a place? Mm-hmm. And in a country like the you know, United States, people are highly mobile. You know, um, it's a lot of territory in which everyone speaks the same language. 
it's it it's very easy to become dissociative. And so David King's, you know, without embarking on a lecture on on America, mm. David King's idea really is I fucked up with my wife mm. and I fucked up with my daughter. And um I have no family. I just have a business. What gives me meaning? And as if a sign from above, this cousin crops up in Israel and says, hey, I just got out of the army. Can you give me a job? And he seizes on this kid who's 21 years old, and he wants to make him a substitute son, both because it, 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 it gives him a role as a parent or as a substitute parent, and it also gives him a, a role as a Jew because it gives him a sense of being a, uh, of having some genuine or authentic meaning to his identity, which has always served him in sort of good stead as defining him as an other with regard to a, 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 a dominant um, presence or a dominant class that he could never fully infiltrate. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so it, it comes as a great convenience to him. Mm -hmm. And let's, let's talk a little bit about Yoav, because he's having his own... I guess struggle with identity and it, it's it's interesting because one of the sort of you talk about this breakdown of of identity and breakdown of cohesion and one mm -hmm. of the sort of the cliche um solutions to that that is often trotted out is well you know uh since conscription mm -hmm. ended you know it doesn't give people a sense of community it doesn't give people a sense of nation sure. and if if such a thing existed then or maybe since socialism mm -hmm. failed and of course you yes, yeah. is in that position i mean he right. he grew, has grown up in a, a situation where or the last few years he spent in a sort of uh, defined idea of what of what the nation and his role in the nation is. Sure. Yeah, I mean, he, he grows up in, 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 in Israel with parents. Mm -hmm. You know, parents. <laughs> and, uh, and, you know, he goes into the army, you know, beginning sort of procedures at 17, is inducted at 18, serves his three years. Mm -hmm. Uh, including in those three years of service is, is Tsuketan, is the, the, the third Gaza War, 2014, which he's a veteran. He's always been told what to do, whether by family, whether by the state, his army commanders. And suddenly he's out, and he's 21 years old. And, you know, Israel is a country where, you know, you can't drive out of it. You can't take a Eurostar out of Israel to a neighboring country. You know, to leave Israel, you, you, you know, you need to leave. You need to go pretty far. And um, and uh, and he's adrift, and uh, and he finds himself for the first time making every single decision for himself. Those decisions are, you know, as banal as what do I eat for breakfast? Do I eat breakfast? Why breakfast? You know, <laughs> to you know, to 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 who do I represent myself to other people as? To to you know. Am I an Israeli? Am I a Jew? Should I pass as an Arab? Should I speak decent Arabic? You know, um, uh, what do I do for a living? Is what I are the skills that I have uh, only kind of useful and immoral professions? And then that leads to a political awakening: the idea that that oh, possibly the things that are legal are not just; possibly the things that are um, expeditious and efficient and again legal in my society. Are um, are none of those things in a pluralistic democracy, and uh, and so he he comes of age, but all at once, mm -hmm. and and can't even almost distinguish the um, you know the different valences of the questions. I mean, you know, what you have for breakfast is a less important decision about than, than how you treat other people, but but for him, this is the first time of really answering any of these, mm -hmm. and he finds them as the employee of his cousin um, being charged with. You know, at first moving, but then doing eviction moving, and taking people out of their homes, um, mostly black and uh, and Hispanic residents of the outer boroughs of New York City, and he finds this sort of <clears throat> unmistakable rhyme with some of the things that he was asked to do, um, not just in the Gaza War, but 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 in his service uh, in 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 the West Bank. Mm -hmm. I'll come back to that that sort of question of the unmistakable rhyme in a minute because you mentioned that there wasn't. Uh, a specific thesis to this book, but if I, I think if one could be 
kind of pinpointed, or at least mm-hmm. the sort of the the yeah, let's go for it. The echo of a thesis, it would be something to do that. But I was just want to before yeah. we get to that, I just want to return to this experience of construct, conscription and the three years in the army because right. it seems, in a way, quite a sort of a unique experience that um, the in, the young Israelis go through it and. At yeah. the moment, uh, which is sort of for the most part, though, they spend a three years in the army, and then a, a lot of them then head off for a gap year. They'll sort of, yeah. uh, they'll travel the world. They'll, um, mm-hmm. you know, and and in fact, I remember this from personal experience meeting some young Israelis in Mexico, mm-hmm. and at the time, not having any any context of this, not knowing, and and finding a kind of a sense of as perhaps worldliness that didn't exist amongst the the Brits, the Canadians, the Americans. Um, that uh, that I, that I also met at the same time that were staying in the same hostels, and it just um, and it was only a few years later that I sort of discovered this uh, you know this, this the, the conscription and the, yeah. and it, it sort of it struck me that, that this is yeah there's something unique and perhaps uniquely I don't want to say traumatic but uniquely defining mm-hmm. um, to to sort of Israeli youth in because of this these three years yeah no I, I mean I think so I mean very much so I mean in, in fact that I mean that that it, you know the the great thing that that separates me from my cousins from nine ten cousins who are around my age so people that i you know saw every year growing up it it it, it it's not that you know we day to day spoke a different language even though you know i speak hebrew and they speak english uh it's not that you know i'm a writer of stupid books and they actually have real jobs now uh it's it's that they served and i didn't I mean, that, that is the real, it, that is the defining aspect of Israeli society, without a doubt. It's that three years of their lives, whether they had a political formation of this at 17 or not, mm-hmm. this is what they did. And, uh, and it is the cauldron for, um, for that society, mm-hmm. you know, to such a degree that to even suggest something like the existence of PTSD or an equivalent in Israeli society is... is, is, is um, is verboten because because that would essentially be to diagnose an entire society with, you know, with a serious uh, uh, psychosis with serious you know psychological syndrome, and um, you know that that is a uh, it is it is a defining moment for for men and women alike. It it also separates the secular from the religious because the religious sometimes do alternate types of national service. You know. Um, and especially those who go into forward combat roles, it's a uh, it's a great um, it's a great divide. It's a uh, it's a divide that essentially um, is the equivalent of college acceptance to a large degree in the states, mm-hmm. which is to say, you know, when you're 17, you want to get, you know, if you can't get into intelligence, you want to get into a a serious infantry unit. Or the Tzanchanim, the the paratroopers, or something along those lines, um, not just because you know it's cool to jump out of planes, even though the paratroopers really don't jump out of planes anymore, but uh, uh, but really because these are networks that can get you a job when you get out and can 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 serve your future. I mean, this is like you know there are you know it's it's a cheap American word. I don't know what the equivalent would be. But it's it's an alumni ne- network. It's it's people who come back and do reserve duty every year, and they, they they if they have jobs, they try to hire people out of the same units, and um, and so it's it's really you know if you intend to stay in that country, it's a determinative factor in your future, mm-hmm. and and so for someone who leaves, there's also the question of um, how long do you leave for, and what's interesting to me, I mean, when I lived for years in Berlin. You know, I spent some time in, in, in Czech Republic, and then when I was in, in Russia and Ukraine especially, which is, you know, certain years of my life, you know, there, there was always that point among the Israelis that I met where um, the decision comes to not leave, to stay, to become, you know, to go to Israel, you know, to move to Israel is to make Aliyah. I think most people know that word, you know, to, be, to make Aliyah to, to a country is to go up, you know, because Jerusalem's on a hill, so you're going up. But, you know, the opposite is to be a Yerida, to go down, to descend. And when you don't come back to the country, that's a serious source of shame. Mm-hmm. It's a betrayal of, 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 of grandparents in many ways. It's read against the, the, the context of the Holocaust as sort of a, 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 you know, why would you stay in Berlin? Mm-hmm. Berlin now is like the largest Israeli expat population of, of you know, the large population of Israelis anywhere outside of Israel. 
and uh, and so you know there there is this there is this sort of there is that sense, mm-hmm. and so in in that military identity, it also colors an enormous amount of the way that 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 they engage with the world, mm-hmm. and um, and so part of my my hope in this book was to kind of show the ways in which. Um, you know, a political novel in which you're just I'm selling my politics I and mean, be pointless. You know, as if I had like a politics that be pushed at someone, but but to show the process by which someone begins to even recognize mm-hmm. that their life also has an ideological aspect mm-hmm. was interesting to me. And also, I guess that's in a way what divides um, the lives of uh, Yoav and Uri as well, mm-hmm. because sort of of course Yoav leaves immediately, and Uri. I won't go through the whole process of how he gets to America and how he mm-hmm. des- decides. Well, to I mean, be- basically, his squad mates just mm-hmm. you know, put together the money and get him out mm-hmm. because he's too much of a fuck up in Israel mm-hmm. and he's scaring people. You and, know, yeah. and the, in fact, the dynamic between them, as they remember from from, from right. their time in the army, changes significantly in this uh, in this new context. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, Which it, both of them find difficult to to deal with. I mean, I, I really saw. Um, you know, this isn't a book that. I can spoil for you, so you know there's no like surprise. Uh, and or if you think it's a surprise, then you're probably not reading it right. But it's you know it's it's you know Yoav is a person who kind of comes to political consciousness, mm-hmm. and Uri is a person who's so scarred by his service that he essentially you know in the in the great American phrase you know commits suicide by cop. Mm-hmm. He he during a a a they're they're evicting a guy. Named Avery Luder, who's Imam Nabi, who's a, 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 a black uh, resident of uh, of a neighborhood that I made up, which is, you know, somewhere near Ridgewood, uh, kind of between Brooklyn and Queens, and they 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 go to evict him, and he won't leave, mm-hmm. and uh, and he sort of stages, a, you know, a protest. I'm not going to leave, and so it, it results in a in a in a standoff. And um, and in a conflagration, and in that the the police come, and Uri, in a kind of moment of rage, inserts himself in front of the police, in front of the NYPD, and gets himself killed. And that for me is like you know was was not only a response to you know a number of police shootings in, in the United States, uh, on the most obvious level, but it's really this idea also of you know, you either come to political consciousness or you succumb to uh, to never transcending the boundaries mm-hmm. with which you were raised. Mm-hmm. You know, never transcending the, the mind uh, which, with which you were, you know, um, raised. And, mm-hmm. and so that, that really is Uri's fate. And, um, and, and so I wanted to kind of dramatize both of those. Mm-hmm. And I think um, before I open to questions from the audience, if you have a question for Joshua, get ready, uh, raise your hand, we'll get a microphone to you. But I just want to return then to that idea about uh, the book's potential thesis, whether there is one or not, or the rhyme you spoke about, about the um, Yoav and Uri finding things in this activity of uh, eviction Mm -hmm. and and occupation of buildings uh, that rhyme with their their experience um, Mm -hmm. in the Israeli army. Um, I mean, I've seen in, 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 certain, in certain reviews and certain write-ups of the book, people sort of saying that, you know, he is clearly um, drawing a comparison between the sort of the, the financial insecurity, the rela- you know, race relations in the United States and, for example, uh, the, mm. the activities of the Israeli army. Was it as clear as that to you when you were writing it, or is it sort of... Is there I mean, man, if it was as clear as that to me when I was writing it, I'd just do math, you know? <laughs> I mean... This whole idea that like uh, a metaphor has some, you know, scientific or mathematical function, mm-hmm. that it's some sort of equation, mm-hmm. that you can map one situation one to one on another situation is insane to me. Mm-hmm. You know, a metaphor to me was always a leap of faith. Or if not a leap of faith, then maybe like a, a, a car accident or a mm-hmm. collision. You know, I kind of see a metaphor as, you know, thing A is driving really fast and thing B is driving really fast and they kind of take a turn and they just smash into each mm-hmm. other. And, and you, the reader, are just sort of the rubbernecker on the curb just looking at the collision and how you interpret mm-hmm. fault, how you interpret liability, mm-hmm. is entirely a diagnosis mm-hmm. of your own perception and a diagnosis of your own uh, soul, mm-hmm. in a way. You know, the idea that, that, that uh, a writer needs to be responsible for the political ramifications of their metaphor is just, I mean, that's a world that I don't want to live mm-hmm. in. 
you know um i think that 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 to propose these things not just as real um acts which is to say <coughs> there are people in this world who have served in wars mm -hmm. and then worked as eviction movers mm -hmm. because eviction moving companies tend to hire veterans of armies mm -hmm because they're good at that shit. Uh, it, that's a fact. But beyond that, there is a sense that, 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 that I, I, I wanted to put a suspicion onto the page mm -hmm. and to put a feeling onto the page, to put a feeling of what it, what it was like after the sort of failure of the Occupy movement uh, in the States, or if you want to be a little bit more optimistic about it, the transcendence of the Occupy movement into the Sanders campaign, <laughs> which then failed. Uh, you know, then there is this idea that, um, that, that, that the people who went to protest these evictions that happened in the wake of the 2008 financial crisis um, were essentially dealing um, for the first time with the true militarization mm -hmm. of a police force. They were dealing with um, military tactics used on civilians, on citizens. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so regardless of the responsibility of the metaphor in a geopolitical context, I will say that as a, as a, as a resident of New York and at heart a citizen of New Jersey, um, I had never seen um, that military presence in the streets I grew up on. Mm. I'd never seen um, armored vehicles on city streets. I'd never seen private contractors armed to act against civilians with um, police support. Mm -hmm. And I had never felt that sense of, in, um, of a home invasion um, really before 2009. Yeah. Okay, thank you. I'm going to turn it over to you guys. If you have a question for Joshua, just put up your hand. We'll get a microphone to you uh, as quickly as we can. Um, well, we'll pass it across. We can pass it across the front. Okay. I could hear you from here. I yeah. oh. hope everyone else can. Thank you. Um, it was really interesting that at the end you'd kind of started talking about real acts and metaphors because I'd kind of think, been thinking about something I was going to ask before that. I was going to ask a question, um, which I hope is fair, about the way you've chosen to write the book, um, because I haven't read it. I have got a copy and I will read it. Um, but First I have step. read um, Four New Messages and it's a very different kind of text in its slips between, um, you know, it's, it's very virtual, but, you know, all sorts of things happen which... Um, which don't seem to be things that we are told normally can happen in reality. Whereas here you've got a world which, um, you know, which, is, a, which is about storage, it's about objects, but also it's, it's a style which conjures objects, you know, it conjures overcooked ribs and flaccid penises. Mm. Um, so, on one hand, you, you've chosen to write something in a genre which I guess we could call realism, possibly, if that's fair. Um, on the other hand, you've also, um, you're also writing within a genre of um, the middle-aged man in crisis, um, which, is, part, which, is, yeah. which, is, which is not only... Yeah, well, I haven't read it yet, and I, I will. Um, which is not only kind of something that we accept as realism, but is also a great American tradition, and, right. um, and in that way links to that thing you were saying about people taking their identity from cultural products such as Sopranos and... Um, you know, Woody Allen movies, another kind of person who was always writing about middle-aged men in crises. So, mm -hmm. you know, I just wanted to hopefully ask you something about the relationship between this kind of realist way in which you're writing and um, maybe something to do with this interest in the importance of objects in our lives. Sorry, that was long. No, 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 no. <laughs> I mean, I, mean, I, I you know... Uh, uh, you know, middle-aged men in crisis fuck up the world, you know? And so, so you know, I, I don't... Uh, I wish I had more of that ability to sort of... Um, to, write, to be the kind of writer who could write about the world as I would want it to be. I'm really bad at it. I mean, if you read Four New Messages, you know that I'm really bad at imagining the world as it could be. But in and I just... Messages slide in and out of screens and go into worlds entirely inhabited by porn actors and right. you know, all sorts of things that 
Right. I, I feel it might not be happening in this book. No, no, right, right. But what I'm trying to say is, is that like I, 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 I wish uh, there, there are really, and I'm not just saying this as, as it could sound like an easy out, but I'm being very sincere about it. Where it's like I, I wish I could write something that didn't have someone's face in the shit. You know, that wasn't such a, you know, the German, you know, to be such a, like a Nestbeschmutzer. My life, you know, like where it wasn't like, let's talk about a guy's porn habit. Let's talk about a, a guy's predatory loan practices. You know, let's talk about, you know, the avariciousness of a certain character. I, I wish I could, you know, see my way around these things, but I kind of can't. I mean, I'm not animated by, by that. So you tie this to realism with desire to... Right, so so like I, I don't even call it realism because I'm not even really sure what realism no, no, is. Well, I'm, I'm not. As I said, it's it's kind of All right. It's, it's it's a genre as well as something which comes as objects. It's it's certainly linking into it seems a kind of genre of um of well an American trope. Yeah, I mean, I I, I see I see realism at this point as you know a nice word that's an antithesis to autofiction, which is to say realism is just stuff that's made up. You know, like realism is like it's it's like it's like stuff that it happens, but it didn't happen to me. That's what I call realism. And autofiction is like it's like stuff that would happen to you, but it happened to me. You know, and and I I tend to kind of divide the world up a little bit differently, which is to say there are things that exercise my imagination. There are things that that they, that, that that I want to work on. There are things that I want to kind of work out in my own head that have to do with um, shame. Um, anger, uh, distress, and uh, and that seems to be my mode, for better or worse. Uh, there's certainly an element of my personality that says it would be nice if life was like X or life was like Y, but for some reason when that gets to the page, it seems patronizing, and I don't know how to do it, and I wish I, 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 wish I were better at it. Um, the objects, as you say, are just you know are the realia are the you know they're the evidence of of um of the attitudes desires and appetites that i'm writing about um because sort of the greatest details of an evil person are the objects that they surround themselves with right they tend to want things they tend to want to deprive other people of things and um and so uh that to me was was interesting in this book um, and how it's different from Four New Messages, which is the same way that it's different from Book of Numbers, is that a lot of the, um, is that I, I sort of was tired of the pain of the internet. I mean, I'm like every other asshole that was sort of like, you know, it's nice writing about the internet when we're all living a neoliberal fantasy. But, but the truth of the matter is, it's like, you know, w when you want to write about real pain, it's never anything that happens on an, an app or a platform. And uh, I think I was sort of impatient with having written a 600-page book that, you know, a lot of its angst was largely online. And it felt like it was time to kind of uh, make things happen on the body and happen um, in the wallet in real ways. I think we've got time for one more question. Oh, that was that long of an answer, <laughs> Jesus. I'm sorry. <laughs> Uh, you know, they all read it in English, and you know that's a self-selecting crew. Uh, the Israeli left still exists. Um, how does it? How is it accepted? You know, honestly, there's no one better at criticizing Israel than the Israeli left, and the Israeli right's not going to read the book. So, uh, you know, I, I I think that you know there's always this sort of. Um, Especially coming from America, there's always this, 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 like you know, liberal hubris that like no one can criticize a country like we can, you know. But the truth is, is that like homegrown criticism, uh, in almost every place that this language criticizes, uh, does it better, and uh, and so I think in in many ways, it's um, you know, it's 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 welcome. Uh, I think that. Uh, to a large degree, there's an element in it that they read differently than I think most other audiences do. Um, 
and that's a very long answer, but I'll be very brief with it, which is to say that, you know, the typical depiction of, of Israelis and to even extrapolate that Jews in fiction are, you know, are like, um, are like Jews that you would point out visually as Jews in Paris or in anywhere else in, in, in Europe or in America. You know, you have your Shkreimel, you have your Peus, you have your Tzitzit, you're wearing a yarmulke, you got a beard, you look like an old guy. You're like 25 pounds overweight. You're wearing a black suit. You're wearing a white shirt. You're a chassid, right? And that is like, that's the image. And that's the Ashkenaz Jewish image. But the truth is, is that Israel is now majority Mizrahi, majority of Jews born from families from Arab lands, um, mostly from families that were kicked out of Arab countries between the 1950s and the late 70s or early 80s. Um, for whom the very term Ashkenaz is a synonym for weakness. You know, when I sit there and, you know, and I do my little Shalom Achshav, like, you know, like little peace, little like, you know, peace plea, they say, you know, don't be such an Ashkenaz, which people will excuse me, but like, that's really like them saying in American English, don't be such a pussy, you know? I mean, that's really what they mean. And, and you know, saying like, don't be such a Western Jew who believes in humanism, you know? Uh, uh, we come from families who, you know, were kicked out of, you know, were kicked out of Tangier, we were kicked out of, you know, Tehran, we were kicked out of, you know, and 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 and, and you know, we know how these people think, you know, this this sort of thing, and and that is a, a predominant force in Israeli society, which has not been represented in the literature of Jewish America, uh, certainly not represented in whatever passes for the literature of. Jewish Europe, and uh, and and is not really in Israeli society. And in fact, the Mizrahi writers who are pushing for a sense of identity uh, uh, in Israeli society were deeply sidelined for years. I mean, you know, they they were you know, Hapantarim Hashacharim. You know, they were they called themselves the Black Panthers. You know, because they were in from their sense like the the the, the dark Jews who were trying to say. Um, they should have a voice, and so you know the idea of like a, a white Ashkenaz, like a like a a good Yeka, writing that for them, I think, is both interesting but a problem, and uh, uh, so it's fun. <laughs> <laughs> but I figure, you know, they like they like married my cousins, so like they, you know, <laughs> they have to deal with it, which I think is a perfect note uh, to leave it on the. The conversation isn't over. The event is uh, the evening isn't over. Please do stick around. Have a glass of wine with us. Uh, come up, get your book signed by Joshua. We have, of course, stacks of Moving Kings uh, in this beautiful Fitzcarraldo editions uh, version. We also have uh, all of Joshua's backlist as well. So all of that's going to be available at the um, at the till. Um, and as I say, yeah, do do stick around. Have a glass of wine. Continue the conversation with each other and with Joshua. And one more time, please do give it up for Joshua Cohen. Thank you. Thank you very much.